yourself again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn You look back and it's all in the past I'm dwelling on the thoughts I cannot say to you If I don't say the words that may be Good morning, welcome to NUFC Matters on a, another happy Sunday with me, Mitch and Stu. Newcastle United 4, Aston Villa nil. Uh, sub on the tain, uh, no more. And as Rob says in the chat, sub on the tain with laughter. Um, never has a, a, a banner uh, been as, um, you know, despised as much as that one when we were relegated with Shearer in charge and, you know, a couple of fans uh, crying. But most of us who wouldn't wear dignity. Uh, as we as we dropped down into the championship that season, but I think that banner is well and truly stuffed up that backside, Mitch. Now. Isn't it? I'm set on fire. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it, it, it really can, it can be ran back at them at 100 miles an hour. We thought there would be more about them, but I think they've shown in that squad yesterday that the that performance after Gerard death was all about Gerard leaving and nothing about a new manager coming in and good luck to him. You know, and, and to be fair, I don't even think we really barely got into third gear. I think there was a lot more in the tank there had we needed it. Um, I think we played better in other games, but um, what a clinical um, and exciting way to put them to the sword, and it was a great day yesterday. It was still a lovely anniversary present as well for me, and Dad, and Amanda. Yeah, and he was blowing kisses to Viggy as well, wasn't he? Yeah. So I forgot to say good morning from the Champion League spots there. So I'm <laughs> saying <it there. laughs> No, but uh, it was a savvy performance, a streetwise performance, because the first off was very unsettling, wasn't it? It was stop, start, stop, start. But they kept the composure, they kept the belief, and ran out fantastic winners in the end. And if you add that to the Tottenham game, these have probably been our best two consecutive games we've played as a team for a long, long time. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, as always, um, it's always difficult to pick out man of the matches in these games. Um, I think looking across social media, I think we all had pretty much the similar kind of thoughts. I mean, I, you know, I was at the game live. At, Joe Linton um, was immense yesterday um, in front of the Brazilian manager. Um, it was obviously Villa trying to spoil us in the first half and... You know, they, they, they were really closing us down. They were hurrying us. I knew they wouldn't be able to keep that up for 90 minutes because we are a very, very, very fit team. Um, Dan Byrne got off to a little sticky start, but again, was immense in that back four. Uh, and and for me, um, Callum Wilson, once again, just leading the line and, you know, coming away with, you know, a comfortable penalty. Um, if ever I've seen one at St James's Park, although Trippy, I was trying to wind him up by keeping a hold of the ball uh, briefly. Um, and then just a, a trademark back post Nuches header. Um, but yeah, look, if I had to pick one, I would have given it to Joel Linton yesterday. What about you, Mitch? Good question, because everybody played a role, including some of the substitutes. I think if you look at some of the uh, performances out there, there were some very good contributions from all over the pitch. Um, good defensive work, great battling in the field, good technical work, and skill to finish off there and some excellent goals. Um, I think Joe Linton just picked it for me because he just seemed to be everywhere. It was one of those games where, he, he, you know, we, we got him as a so-called left-sided striker come number nine. And now we've got this sort of box-to-box midfielder. And pretty much, I haven't seen any of the heat maps or anything, but I bet is he's just everywhere because he seemed to be everywhere. What about you, Stu? I know it's difficult when you're watching on a feed um, and, and, you know, because you're relying on the camera angles um, of, of, you know, the, the, the director on the day. Uh, it's interesting because Eddie Howe obviously talked about commentary. He said he, he, he watches games with a commentary off because he doesn't like it to divert away from his own thoughts on the action, which is, which is quite interesting. But, yeah, you're, you're man of the match. Well, it was, it was difficult to choose from. I, I don't watch on a feed. I watch it on BN Sports and... Uh, I prefer to watch it Arabic because the commentators I've got on in English aren't any good. So I just listen to it in Arabic and they get far more excited, as I'm sure Mitchell will be reciprocate. But you have people like Miggy and, and Botman. And Botman was imperious again yesterday. Miggy again outstanding. You mentioned Joelton was immense. 
Uh, but people like Botman and Bruno and Miggy now, because they're that consistently good, they're becoming a victim of their own success. It's something I mentioned about Gaza a few weeks back. You know, unless he was doing 10 out of 10s, he was just a standard seven. But Longstaff, I thought, was exceptional yesterday. He was, it was, his, he was at his industrious best. But for me, the man of the match was Dan Byrne. I, I really thought he played his best game. I've seen him play for Newcastle. Uh, there was a challenge when it was nil-nil that he had to take the perfection in our box. Uh, and he did that. And he seemed to grow into the game. Uh, and his confidence was there. Uh, also, Darren Southgate was there. So it was a good time for him to, to, sh to show, look, I could get on the left side. And it was, I put a tweet out last night that's, it was telling to me that they took Botman off and put um, Burn in the middle. And it was as if when we were like, winning comfortably, it was as if to say, you've got these two supposed English potential strikers and Watkins and Ings. And Dan Byrne just went in there to say, look, I can play centre-half and left back. And it was also nice of TT to come and uh, give Joe Linton his plane ticket as well in person. Very kind of Because for sure, Callum Wilson, he... He must have rubber stamped his seat on the plane yesterday. Yeah, I was going to ask sure. you that question next, you. So I, I will ask you do, you, do you think that that's the case? I mean, you know, Tom Dixon is saying that it was great to see Southgate there yesterday. Watch Wilson score both goals, so hopefully he will be on the plane at uh, Qatar. But John Askew says Wilson might deserve to be on the plane, but it's a potential disaster waiting to happen for Newcastle United. And Ian, uh, keeping on the England theme, says if Mings gets in the England squad before Burn, it's ridiculous. What's the chances of Bills, Wilson and Burn going to Qatar, in your opinion, Stu? I, I, I think Burn um, should go. But again, it's something uh, with Southgate. He becomes too loyal and you'd have to be proactive and forward thinking and picking players on form. If it's on form, Burn goes. I don't think anyone can debate that. He's part of the meanest defence in the league. Um, regarding Wilson, who realistically is there, if you take Kane out of it, they're all much of a muchness. And it's not just Wilson scoring the goals, it's his work rate, how he plays off the shoulder, how he can hold the ball up, how he finds space, how he creates space. And I can see why people are saying it'll be bad for Newcastle if he goes and gets injured. But the chance of him going and getting much game time would just probably limited anyway. He'd be there as a backup to Kane. So his, his minutes would be limited and we shouldn't be stopping players because it, it's the pinnacle of the career, isn't it? Representing your country in the World Cup. You know, we should be encouraging as many possible to go because when they get on the pitch, the whole world sees Callum Wilson and underneath it, it says Newcastle United. Just like they'll say Bruno, just like they'll say Botman, just like they'll say Sean, etc. We should have as many, and Trippier, we should have as many as possible go to, on, on the, to Qatar next month. And it, it's, it can only be good for the growth of the club as well. And he deserves it. Wilson does deserve it because he's never complained. And he's come back sharp and willing uh, and with the perfect attitude for a number nine. Yeah, uh, Blue Burn Boy says Burn won't go. Unfortunately, he's had no prior involvement with the England setup. Uh, Mitch, what's your take on uh, potential call ups for the uh, the England duo? Uh, Southgate constantly contradicts himself. You can tell the media he picks on form. But it's quite clear, he doesn't just pick uh, favourites, he picks people he's known from under-20s, under-21s. Uh, and that seems to count to him more than the actual current form. I think the Mings comparison to, to Burn is one. You could chuck Target into the mix as well, really, because who really is there at left full-back? Um, and Target should be in the conversation, and we know he won't be. Um, and uh, as for people getting concerned about what players going away with England. Um, I think that's just reflective of the negative mindsets that have been almost conditioned into it's the Stockholm syndrome uh, that we have from uh, it's just, yeah, the Stockholm syndrome that we have from that, you know, you can't believe that good things happen to it. And if something does good come along, it's going to have a catch. And the catch will be, be injured forever. Um, and I think we've got, I think Stu's quite right. He says, you know, we we are limiting our own players by saying all that we do in England because that puts Newcastle United in the headlines in the World Cup. Might be the tipping point between somebody saying, you know what, I fancy going to send them here for them, and somebody not. So I think we've got to, you know, be joyful and grateful that we've got players knocking on the door like that. And the reason we've got them knocking on the door like that 
is anyhow in the way we're playing and the fact we're in fourth league in fourth place in the league of looking good. You mentioned the subs yesterday. Obviously, we got an extra one because of the concussion, uh, Mitch. I know there's a few people panicking after the match at uh, the Dog and Parrot yeah. going, oh my God, we're going to get points deducted. We brought an extra sub on, but they, they clearly missed that rule change that came in a few years back about um, about that. Um, so, look, we got an extra sub, but you touched on it earlier. The use of the subs yesterday was quite interesting. And um, ASM coming on, obviously, only had a little cameo. Uh, Shelby coming on, etc. But... You know, what, what, what's becoming more apparent is obviously the, the strength and depth we're, we're seeing we've accumulated now and when you know we get our other players back you know the likes of Isaac etc it's going to be you know it's, it's, it's going to be interesting isn't it it's going to have some decisions to make yeah and that's that's ten, testimony to the squad improving like we're talking about on Amigos about how people were worrying about how tired we were looking at if, if you take the, the minutes that Shelby Wilson Isaac and ASM haven't done because of injury, but take those minutes out of everybody else's legs, how much pressure we bring into the squad. And so I think that's why uh, Eddie's in place, is to make his... oh, We're losing Mitch. His uh, reception's not too good there. Um, Sorry, yeah, somebody lost... keeps trying, some dickhead keeps trying to call us, give us two seconds. All right, we'll take you out. Um, basically, Stu, the substitutions that we're making on a you know on a match basis are, are you know are increasingly showing how, how you know much of a strength and depth we've got with the squad. But on top of that, players are coming in and they're knowing their jobs, Stu. Um, I'll, I'll give you for instance, Murphy. Sometimes coming into a game like that where the team's on a high, it can disrupt the pattern of play. Uh, but Murphy came on yesterday. And he was straight into the flow of it and, and, you know, almost scored, you know, that wonderful shot which hit the post. It shows yeah. how, how well drilled he's got the team, you know, that somebody can suddenly just come into the team, know their job and bang, that they're just as good as the player who's gone off. Yeah, it's the phrase he used there, well drilled. I think it hits it perfectly. The, the meticulous planning that Eddie Howley's staff was going through the there was a complaint a few weeks back that we don't score from corners. Well, we did yesterday, didn't we? Where Wilson's second goal, that was that came from a corner. It was a well-worked routine as well. Um, and it shows that they're all enjoying it. And if you've got someone like Murphy coming off the bench, um, this is the bit that we've talked about with how, how he has to then look at different players and think, right, we have to advance. And then when you have people like ASM coming off the bench, that's the sort of quality that we need on that bench. And... And I think how has proved himself to be loyal to players in the team as long as they're performing. And that it can only be good for the Newcastle United when you've got people like Isaac and ASM uh, uh, fit and in, in his prime Shelby pushing, trying to get in his team. It can only be good for us because the ones that are in the current possession have to keep performing as they are to, to keep in it. And if you look at the work rate, the work ethic, the, the willingness, as you said, people come on, they know exactly what they want, to, what they need to do, what they have to do. And I think anyhow, Jason Tindall and all of them, they need a massive slap on the back and then say, well done. And it'll keep going. You know, the, they've, they've caught some, well, they've gotten on to some sort of winning formula and, and they know it and they know what needs to be taken, and, and I, I'm sure the players will keep their feet in the ground. If you look at Eddie Howe's press conference on Friday, uh, he was quite clear that the team had trained well, and they knew exactly what was ahead. So the preparation's there, and then it comes down to the attitude, and the players are showing an incredible attitude. And there was a video last night that was released, watched them all come back in after the, the pros they took, and Darren Eels is waiting to come. congratulate them. There's a huge togetherness in this club, and long way it continue. Yeah, I saw that Darren Eels down in the tunnel area, uh, you know, basically, cl you know, clapping and, you know, shaking the hands. It was absolutely fantastic. A few comments uh, coming in as well. I thought Murphy looked decent uh, when he came on, was unlucky not to score. How many times, and this is a question I asked at um, the Dog and Parrot yesterday, how many times has Murphy hit the post? Um, he must he must have some stats on, on hitting the bar and hitting the post uh, since he signed for the club. Like, he is very, very unlucky at times in front of the goal. Um, I'm surprised the ref didn't try and VAR out the penalty. He was, as usual, a referee in disgrace. Yeah, Paul Tierney. Um, it was all about him in the first half, certainly. Joe Linton had a chance to impress the Brazil manager who was in attendance yesterday. Deserves a call-up and 
Look, if England get knocked out, I think half a uh, half a time side will be going out buying a yellow uh, Brazil strip and wearing it and cheering on Bruno and Joe Linton if they're both there. To be honest, we had Jacob Murphy. The point I was making before you had before you had to jump off, uh, Mitch, was how good it is to see someone like Murphy come on in a game where you know we know sometimes it's difficult as a football player to get involved in it. But the the phrase I used with uh, Stu was well drilled. You know, you come mm. on. Do his job and straight away he was into the flow of the game well, and almost scored. That was very much who I had in mind when I said contributions from the subs. You know, he come on and he looked dangerous, he looked keen, he hit the post, he had a, another good shot. Um, he looked like he was ready to contribute. And, and again, he, he rocked up in a couple of different positions. I think he's probably played in about four different positions and he's come on and, uh, over the season, you know, and you, you can't. Um, you, you can't criticise him in any way, shape or form for that. He, he, he does deserve a goal. You think how many times he's also been through on the keeper and dinged it over the keeper and it's hit the post and come out and somebody else has finished it. And I reckon all day long in training he puts them away and yet stick him <laughs> in St James's Park, he's banging them off the post, you know. Um, but he, he's like Miggy, he's playing with energy and with a smile on his face and now he's flourishing with it. And so I think that's that's fantastic. I think, uh, um, again, somebody else who's honestly up his game. We know he's got his limitations. We know he's, he, he's um, sort of in the long term probably not uh, any part of any answer. But right now, you can't knock what contribution he makes when he steps off the bench. It's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. It is. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to go for this one. Uh, from Neil Calvert. He says, question for the lads. The chairman has hinted recently that come January, our potential transfer targets are going to shock the top teams. Any rumours on who they might be? Um, it was interesting because the Amigos, had a, what, you know, we've got our NUFC Matters WhatsApp chat and there was a few names getting bandied around uh, the other night, but not necessarily coming to Newcastle, Stu. The, the transfer market isn't open yet. The transfer window isn't open yet, but there seems to be plenty of people making a few you know, uh, making a few hints about who's going to go where. So the merry-go-round might be quite interesting, Stu. Yeah, it's, it's what's been discussed, but uh, regarding Newcastle, uh, I'm still informed the very sweet of Madison, but the if you've got someone of Madison's ability and talent and still potential, I still think there's more to come from him, especially in a in the top top side. Um, I'm not saying necessarily the bad team, but it would be a step up going to Newcastle. Of course, there's going to be other suitors for him, uh, and Tottenham have been strongly linked with him. Um, but that was again the the rumor was going. That's because Liverpool wanted Son, and I really can't see Tottenham selling uh, Son to Liverpool. I, re I really can't see that. But if he wanted to go, it's a different matter. So Tottenham were then looking at for Madison. I know that they inquired regarding Miggy, and they were told, go away, I'll be polite, go away, and don't bother coming back with any offer. He's not for sale. But it's, it's going to happen. We're, we're a team that's progressing at a rate of knots. That's, if you look at what we achieved last year, because this you talked about happy anniversaries, this time last year we were actually rock bottom of the league. So if you look what we've done by the end of last season and what we've done this season, it's like two cycles of incredible rise. And, and the players that have done it, the ones that have improved the most are the ones that were there already. So it, it's, it's good that these teams are going to link with us. But if you look at the unity that the players have got, they, when they score, how they look after each other, um, they don't want to go anywhere. They all want to be part of this. So it's, it's good that people want to get linked or that people want to want to buy the same players as us, especially what are supposedly the top clubs. It shows what sort of play, playing field we're on now. But regarding Jacob Murphy, as you all know, every single game are back 3-1. But yesterday, I put an NUFC manager's chat and had a little saver on 4-0. So I was quite pleased when he hit the post. I was also quite pleased that uh, Wood's legs weren't as long as I thought they were when he missed the chance to come across. I was like, I can't believe this. You know, they 4-0 just be comfortable. But no, they, they just kept going, didn't they? I was gutted for Chris Wood, honestly. I, 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 mean, I wouldn't have minded. I wouldn't have minded losing that bet if he had scored. I really wouldn't have. As, as people know who sit around us uh, in the Platinum Club, uh, when Chris Wood comes on, I do. I am the only person who stands up and applauds him and says, go on, Chris. Um, and I was gutted. Yeah, that's yeah, sure. Um, the good news, I mean, this is interesting because obviously I was. I, I, I don't sit too far from me and Bogey at the match. So me and him always have a bit of patter. Um, before the game, and I'm going to be talking to Malcolm about this hopefully uh, this week. But 
Malcolm was invited up to the club um, and to go to the academy to have a chat with the young strikers. And um, he basically went up and gave some advice, but Wilson was also there, Wood was also there, and Malcolm was giving them a bit of, uh, well, giving Chris Wood a bit of advice. So, you know, I, I did ask him uh, what he said uh, to him. Uh, and you can watch that because I always record the Doug and Parrot chat. And he was very careful what he said. Obviously, when he's being invited up by the club, he doesn't want to upset the apple cart. He just said, never be afraid to miss, which, of course, um, is is the title of one of Malcolm's very early books that he did with Gibbo. So, um, yeah, good advice. And um, get your head up, Chris. It will come good. You're still a legend to me, son. And, yeah. uh, you know, keep keep going, mate. That goal will come, I'm sure. Uh, if you can get us to Wembley in the Carabao Cup, I think we'll all be happy. Uh, Mitch, uh, John Askew says, Mitch, do you think we'll go for some star names or just players to improve weak spots? I mean, where are the weak I spots? Think, the- uh, let's be consistent with pretty much what I've said all along about there's no budgets and transfer windows. There's no set ideas of what a transfer window will look like. It depends on who becomes available at what time and if they think that that's a deal to do and it's a good deal. Think of the Isaac deal, for example. We knew we'd been on the radar all summer, but we didn't think anything had progressed with it. And then all of a sudden, for one reason or another, uh, he became available and he was signed. Bang. Um, and there were still people saying that the budget for the last transfer window was going to be £50 million, but we spent more than that on him in one, one whack. And I think this is it. I think I think I don't think there is a set idea of a figure. I don't think there's a set idea of a target. And I think also going into this transfer window, I'll say it again, it's the most unique January window ever. Um in general and particularly for Newcastle United. It it's very, very possible we will still be sitting in the top four come the end of uh the 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 first part of the season ahead of the World Cup. And under Ashley, we know that would mean consolidation, a couple of sales, and nobody brought in. Uh, sit on the laurels and make everything tick. We know under these owners, they mean business. And they say opportunities, not threats. And they say opportunities, not risks. And calculated risks when they do take one. And I think... Um, if the right player becomes available this window, and I think more could than we realise, because there's so much more of the season left after Christmas, because there's so much of an opportunity to keep the momentum going, um, I think, yes, they'll have an idea of the, the, the holes they would like to fill in the squad. I've got no doubt about that. I suspect they're already working on a lot of deals. Um, I, I can't believe Dan Ashworth's just sitting in his office playing Jenga or something, you know, I think he's, he's pretty damn busy for this window and the window after. Um, and I think if a big name of the right temperament that fits the no dickheads policy transfer um, policy uh, comes available, they will go out of their way to try and make it happen if they think it's a good deal. It's as simple as that. There's a good topic, lads, for you to discuss, <laughs> Michael J. PIF, buying it to be on sports, lads? Question marks, Stu. Yes, they are. And I think they'll end up taking them over because when the new rights come out, I think somebody could have just created their own sports channel and blew them out the water. So the word that gets used quite a lot over the last couple of years is geopolitics. It's, let's do this hand in hand and it'll strengthen being sports, not just in the JCC, but globally. You know, because they do uh, lease out their their feeds, I suppose, to other countries. You know, they buy the package and sell them on again. So it's it shows the the power in the region that uh, Mitch and myself have, re- have referred to many times. That Saudi have they are the the biggest boys in the sandpit, for want of a better phrase, and they will do things properly. It also shows with people like Gorilla Gloves how he's changing his tune and. How he's praising Newcastle to a point, although he just come up with some stupid suggestions about trains in London and things. Uh, but yeah, the, the PIF don't just own Newcastle. I'm sure everyone's fully educated on this. They, they look at businesses that are growing, they look at businesses with potential, and they look at businesses they can make money from. So if, if they're buying into that, then the, the boy, the, well, they are buying into it. 
they, they get the TV rights a little make Newcastle even bigger in the region because instead of being third or fourth choice, we'll be first choice most weeks, which again will then, if it has the knock on effect of sponsorship, because in the region, as, as we mentioned so often, it might not be a big name like, like Noon in, New, in Newcastle or in the UK, but in this region, if you've got it on the shirts and everyone sees it every single weekend, then it's worth a lot more than what uh, other, other people have been paid for their shirts. So it's all, to me, it's all, it's like a game of chess. All the, all the parts are getting played slowly, slowly, surely, but they, there's an air of an inevitability that Newcastle will be a huge, huge club globally in the not too distant future. And it's just great that they chose us. It's great that Amanda persevered. And it's and it's great that we are in the position we're in. We should just be lapping it up, enjoying it, and start creating silly protests to make attention for ourselves. But that's another topic. Yeah, we'll come on to that. Um, I did catch up with that last night when I got in. If PIF by being, uh, will we need permission from the Premier League <coughs> to receive the TV money, Mitch? Says our... no. no, I can't see that happening, mate. But I, I get the, the uh, where they... The, Questions coming from, but it, um, I think you probably find the investment will make it to be, and it'll not be more than traditionally when Saudi and PIF want to buy a company, they tend to buy it in an 80 10 10 split, like they've done with Newcastle United, interestingly enough. Uh, it spreads a little bit of the risk out. I think the difference with the dynamic would be in um, the, the, the sponsorship with the Saudi media company, that's the start of this defrosting of everything. Um, the, the next logical step is for PIF to look to buy into be in sports. Um, then that, it, that that regional economic powerhouse that is the Gulf starts to cooperate together. But also Saudi are in the again have skin in the game from television rights, but they've got a ready-made, already trusted, and in-place network on which to sh to screen those across not just across the MENA region, but around the world as well. And so um, it's win-win, and everybody in the Gulf loves a win-win. Everybody loves a deal which everybody can walk away from the table and puff that chest out and say, look what we've done. Um, it's quite clear for the next round of rights um, bids, being with needing assistance financially. They've, they've, they've trimmed staff and they've dropped rights in other areas. Um, all with the mind of retaining the Premier League rights last time, um, and people forget that that you know the, the the there was a hell of a lot of job losses in Doha from being because they were trying to trim their their waistline so they could make sure they retained the Premier League rights. Well, that pressure's off them then, and then what can they become and grow and develop into with assistance from their neighbours? Which yes, it's it's a marriage of convenience in many ways, but money talks. We know that across football for years and it's the fact that the previous ha halves are now so scared of becoming have-nots that they're all squeaking about Super Leagues again because they're, they're, they're floundering and they're making stupid decisions like Barcelona have to you know, sell off their television rights for a competition that mightn't even be in quite amusingly um, so yeah um, I think it's just one move of many that you're going to see over the next couple of years that Newcastle United, whether we like it or not, are going to be front and centre of it. And it's all about our brand being broadcast around the world for the betterment of the club. We've got a headed goal, says Emmett. It's been a while. Uh, set pieces as well, something I brought up on one of the shows a couple of weeks ago, lads. And um, just, just looking back to yesterday's game, Stu, that corner uh, that we took, um, which... The back heel and then the precision cross for Wilson, to, you know, to, you know, to head it into the the bottom corner. It was it was a wonderful goal, but again, another set piece clearly that's been worked on on the training ground, and great for great for us to see that. Yeah, absolutely, it's been worked on. Eddie Howe mentioned it in his his comments after the game. He said it's something they've been doing for years, so they'll just be uh, re replicating some stuff they did at Bournemouth, and you know, it was simple, and that's what made it effective. Just a short corner, create some space, back heel, there you go. And then for the little stab up, it's just up the air. And then it's, if we know what's coming, it's not a 50-50 ball anymore, is it? It, it, it weighs every in our favour. That's it's going to drop to one of us because our, our four players know exactly, from the well-drilled thing that you said earlier, they know exactly what's coming. Uh, and you've got your, your big tall defenders and you've got Wilson hanging around. And... You know, all of a sudden they're, they're trying to push out, but we know how, how to stay in because we know exactly where the ball's coming. 
uh, I'm sure there's, there's many free kicks, there's many set pieces, etc., that they've been working on. And it's great watching them come off. And also the unbridled joy when the, the camera pans to the bench. I know you are all probably jumping up and down going Raj in the stands. But we, we over here get to see the pans to the bench and you see how Tyndall and the, how we embrace each other. And it's a, it's a nod of knowing satisfaction. Yes, that's come off. That worked well. Yeah. And it just shows you it's the harder you work, the luckier you get. And these boys are working so hard they deserve every bit of luck that, that comes their way. Yeah, I mean, headed goals, Mitch. It doesn't matter how to go in, but yeah, I mean, it was, it, it, you know, it was another, you know, just a goal poachers goal from from Wilson. But like the set pieces, as we say, we know they've got, you know, they work hard, Mitch, and it's just good to see them getting the rewards of their labour during the week. As I've said before, it doesn't matter what body part it comes off; it all counts as long as it's not your hand, you know. And so, um, there was also, if you, I look back at it, the highlights this morning, and um, if you look at. When Wilson's heading that ball in, Botman and Byrne behind him have both lost their markers as well. So, so would it just be? And they knew it was coming. <laughs> they, would it just be one of them? Villa were all over the place, and yet, and she was right. You see how and Tindall celebrate like they've scored it themselves. Um, so you'd say it was obviously a training ground move that had come off, and this is what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks: moving the ball to different positions to create different angles and different types of crosses, and to get players into the mix in the box to create overloads and mismatches and that that entire set play worked to perfection. And and more more power to it. Let's have more of that, lads, because um, it, it, it really was a delight to see. And uh, I, I do suspect it wasn't actually meant for Wilson. I suspect it was meant for one of the lads at the back post yeah. uh, initially. But uh, who cares? Who cares who scores it? And who cares how it goes in as long as it counts? Yeah, exactly. Um, you touched on protests before, Stu, so let's talk about it. I, I did catch something online last night, and you know, I, I always advise people on Twitter to uh, to click the link, so to, you know, to, to read uh, the story before you start commenting on stuff, because sometimes you can get caught with your pants down on these kind of things. But this seems to be some kind of organisation, um, far left organisation, which has been set up to um, have its say. Uh, about our owners and the claim to be Newcastle fans who um, want to highlight, um, you know, certain things that they want to highlight about uh, Saudi Arabia as a country and, as they say, the regime that controls it. So, for me, um, they're, they're talking about having a protest at the Chelsea game. Um, I just find all this rather bizarre. I really do. Um, what, what was your take on it when you saw that last night on Twitter? I just thought, read a protest on a Saturday evening. Fans have been drinking all afternoon. The last game before the World Cup, the cost of the Champions League places, it's just trying to incite trouble. And again, I, I talked about it during the week regarding this Santa's eight-year-old boy's Christmas list of Santa. It's people mixing politics and football. If you want to protest, go to the embassy. If you want to protest, do what us two, us two, that way is it, yeah, are doing. Come and live here and, and find out what it's like. Instead of just spouting off Rubbish, which it is, and yeah, I'm, I'm not. I will not condone. There's been some disgraceful atrocities. There's been things that have happened that are, that aren't right. But that's not a talk for a football club. And they keep saying your owners, your owners, our owners are the PIF, and they're an investment vehicle, and that that is it. Now, if we want to get deep into it, uh, you, you can start asking. Do you know these? Um, Gangs that rape young girls and stuff in, in Rochdale and Bradford and everything else. What is it the general consensus people say would like to happen to these people? They should be killed, yes. They shouldn't get jail time. J uh, jail's not good enough for them, etc., etc. Now, what we're trying to do is, is try to, or a small minority are trying to change a whole, not just a nation's belief, a whole religious belief just to suit them. You know, and yes, there was 80 odd people killed. Uh, massacred, murdered, whatever you call it, in, in March earlier this year in Saudi Arabia. But they didn't just pick people off the street. It, these people were known terrorists. They were rapists. They were murderers. And I'm not saying it's the right way to do it, but we we, we can't keep mixing politics and football. And, and this is my gripe against the trust. It's, you know, it, it's the, the people who are doing this protest now, to me, they just come across as champion socialists, just wanting a bit of attention. If they're not really that concerned about it, St. James Park's not the place to be making your protest. Go and do it somewhere else. But if, if you look at like, uh, 
regarding the trust rate in that list of, yes, they, they said they got it from the fans, but I've spoke to a lot of Newcastle fans um, through Twitter, through the fact that I've got friends, and I've asked their feedback on the trust because maybe me being so far away, I've, I've got a, a wrong impression. And the vast majority have said the same thing. They had one chance to show that they were after the fans' best interests and they blew it when they, they bottled with the Premier League. And whether that's the case or not the case, that's the general consensus. Now, to me, a trust should be getting what the supporters want. And again, just my opinion, they're, they're not delivering what the supporters are asking for. They're delivering what is in their best interests. And the best example of that is war flags. I bet you none of us, or not many, could name three people who organise war flags. But they, they are doing what's, what the supporters want. Look at the support they've got, the funding they get. The, you know, the, the worldwide acknowledgement. They, to me, speak more for the fans without saying anything than people who care to speak for the fans. Because what they do is, their job is to make St. James is a better place to be, a more entertaining place, a, a place that people want to visit. And the times I've been back, you've seen people leaving the paint, or oh, I won't get another one, I want to see what flag we've got on this week. You know, that's uniting the fan base. That's speaking for the fans. That's creating what the fans want. Not, oh, well, you know, the Wi-Fi needs to be improved or can we have Carlsberg instead of calling? And, you know, it's, it's listening to the fans. The fans don't want to be involved in politics. They want to support Newcastle, a successful Newcastle. War flags have got a bag on and every credit to them. And it's great that they don't take the funding from the club because I'm sure the club would give them funding for flags. They want to keep it a fans only uh, thing, and it, it, to me, it's, that's admirable. But when you've got, for want of a better phrase, knackers who think, oh, well, I'll protest about this, go and protest in the right places, not at St. James, just go to Riyadh and protest, go to your own government and protest, keep football out of politics, please. But it, they won't, but they should. Great stuff, Stu, as always. Mitch, your take on this? Ah, my back to uh, an argument that we've seen over the last two and a half, three years about the separation of PIF and state. And that was resolved with the Premier League and that is one of the reasons the takeover went through. And so to keep bringing that back, even as Newcastle United supporters, you're yeah, muddy in the waters and basically saying that you utterly and totally disagree with the way the Premier League handled the sale and therefore fundamentally uh, you're wanting us to what go backwards. Um... And that's not to say, as a fan base, we deny the, any issues. If you want a great example of that, look at the responses of ordinary fans to Arabic replies on the Rainbow Laces campaign this weekend, saying, hey, not in our name, not in our club, that's not how we do it and it's not how we are represented, so take your bigoted views away. And I think that's our, our fan base showing themselves that we are educated, we do understand that there's a different point of view, we do understand that in this region there are many things that um, are different and different uh, philosophies on life, um, but you're not going to allow bigotry and hatred to cross a certain line. And these are the questions as a fan base. We don't need a group asking questions which are irrelevant in my opinion these days, um, because I think as a fan base we've shown over the last year we've matured and grown we, we don't bite on every little bit of clickbait that's thrown my way now we pick and choose our arguments and we do it carefully nobody is um, saying that we're going to sit and deny human rights and, and, and many other really important issues um, but again to do it for just one football club and not go and ask anybody with owners from China or anybody from owners from Thailand or anybody from owners from America that there are certain questions that need to be asked answered about their uh, justice systems and the way that they, they handle certain things um, yeah, it, because there seems to be a, a, a genuine push within certain parts of the media at the mini, minute that rich white man's money is good and rich brown man from the Middle East's money is not good and that's across the board. If you want to look at how the uh, BBC hammers Dubai every other day in one way, shape or form on a, on a, uh, on that website, um, the, the agenda, I think, very much does come from, um, a far left perspective. Um, I mean, uh, the, 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 the 
the group in question who are doing that protest um, have been platformed in a couple of well-known fanzines over the last 18 months. Um, and that's right that everybody's point of view is allowed to be heard and is respected. Um, and if they want to do what they do and they're saying it's going to be a silent protest, um, then my ask for everyone going to the game is just walk on by, let them have their time, and then let it go away. Um, don't be provoked into doing something that's just going to give certain parts of the media more fuel uh, to enjoy sticking a knife at Newcastle United. Um, we're not happy to be sports washed. I think my fan base is quite clear on that. We are happy to ask different difficult questions. I think my fan base is quite clear on that. Um, but what we don't want are artificial constructs just designed to create a little bit of a stir in the media. Yeah, it's interesting. Lots of comments coming in. Pete Davison says they'll be looking for an adverse reaction on a match day and our fans will look like we're cheerleaders. That's what they want. Just completely ignore them. Ian says it's a bloody silent protest as well. They know what they're, they'll be drowned out if they started. Um, Kenny just says absolutely bang on, Stu. I haven't trusted the trust for years. Jordy Tuvalik says, who are we, this country, telling another country how their law should be? How would we like Saudi telling us how this country should be run? And Gary says, do, we, uh, do our owners not promote diversity? What would our Saudi owners and the Ruben brothers, a point I've made many times. A uh, few pints says, Stu's on the money again, recording champion socialists and Western snobbery. Craig says, West, uh, war flags have asked for donations for a new super flag. Anyone that donates gets their name on it. And Northumberland Jordy says, football is supposed to be a release from all these outside issues. Why bring them into the game? Uh, all countries have rules and them rules have to be respected. I know Newcastle fans that are going to Saudi to get visa. They had to agree not to break laws. Penalties is a severe rules. Need respect, says he, uh, says Tell. And Ian says, uh, no protest over human rights in Guantanamo Bay. Holding prisoners for years in terrible conditions with no charges. The human rights narrative does not include any other country or Saudi. And Dan makes a good point as well. Mia Dad is Iranian and supporting the women of Iran in their current fight. Yeah, 100 um, percent It's crazy, really. It, it, it really is crazy to, to think that we're still talking about this. But we knew it would come and that's it. Let's move away from the politics. Uh, Rob, I did say this point earlier. And Rob, apologies, I will get in touch with you, mate. Um, I've just been very busy, as you know. Um, is there any support financially to Gateshead? No, I don't think there is. Um, there's been link-ups, though. I think the link-ups between Newcastle and non-league clubs um, is, is a lot better. And, and the boys' clubs is a lot better. And they're going to improve that as, as time goes on. Jersey Mag asked this earlier as well. Should we resurrect the old Des Walker chant for Sven Botman? You'll never beat Sven Botman. You'll never beat Sven Botman. Hey, Jersey Mag, if you're at the match, try it. Give it a, give it a go, mate. You never know. Um, what's the worst that can happen? You can be standing up on your own shouting that song like I am with Chris Wood. Uh, Ian Toon Trader has this question, lads. What do you think the chances are of us going back in for a ticket? Um I've got to be honest with you, I think that ship sailed for the for the young lad. His agent skew with that uh, back in the summer. I can't see that happening at all. Can you? No, the, the opportunity was there, but I don't think we should be giving the young lad a hard time. No. Um, we've discussed it before, but if you look at it from his point of view, he, he's French, he's in there, he's playing in their league, and then you get the opportunity to go and train with like Messi, Ronaldo, no, no, not Ronaldo, sorry, Messi, Neymar, and Mbappe, and you're thinking, yeah, I can learn so much from them, and Smick, I can always say, I, I played with them, and that's what we're talking about in Newcastle, getting good players to attract better players, so PSG had the head start on us on a number of occasions, and there was always a caveat that it wouldn't work out for them, because well, it's great saying that you're training with these players, but is he capable of replacing them, and I think he was misled by his agent on game time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But regarding will we go back in from it, I'd, I'd say never say never because we have returned for players such as Botman when we thought that we weren't going to get them. Um, but that was a snub. They, you know, we got snubbed by Agatiki in the end, didn't we? So they, they felt like they were struggling along. Um, and I reckon we've got bigger fish to fry now. We've, we've probably, as I've touched on before, We've probably accelerated the the learning curve or the model that they had, the owners have got for us to progress. And 
you know, I think now when we're looking to buy players, it will be just the, the odd one or two quality to add that can walk straight into the first team. And they will be handpicked. They will be with the right attitude. They will be with the right temperament. They will be with the right potential still to get even better. So there'll be a certain age group I don't see as getting any 30-plus superstars because that's not what we've got yet. There'll be people in the early to mid-20s who, like, like Madison, can get better and has a great work ethic and, and will fit in with the, with the team spirit because it's not just the 90 minutes that we see or 100 minutes as it was yesterday. It's everything that goes on, the camaraderie and the change of rooms and everything else. And I, I think Ekatiki wouldn't fit into that. So to answer the question in a long way, I don't think we'll get Ekatiki again. Mitch, Ekatiki, done deal now, <clears throat> do you think, uh, or a dead deal? To, to quote the inimitable Winston Davies, oh dear, how sad, never mind. <laughs> and so we move on. And I think for Ekatiki, I think he was targeted because he was a very specific time of his development. And that development has now gone backwards for six months. So he's not the same investment, he's not the same worth, and I think his ship has sailed. I think if we were to go back in for him, we'd not be talking the amounts that we were talking about, that we were happy to pay. Um, and uh, as you rightly pointed out, I think his agent finally put the final nail in his own coffin for that. And uh, the comments from PSG's manager in, in his camp over the last couple of weeks have been, um, well almost predictable so uh, I, th- I think as Stu rightly says we'll have other targets eyes elsewhere um, because I think the one thing about Botman we went in for him but then he continued to develop in that side still had some Champions League football to play um, and so there was no loss in his development and cracking on but I think at a crucial age and at a crucial time to spend most of his time kicking his heels on the bench and now yapping to the press is not a good sign for Ekitike. And I think, uh, yeah, gone. Ta da. Uh, what about Mudrick? Um, I seen Sean earlier on mention him. Um, he's been priced at 85 million. He says, personally, I prefer to go for Harrison and Madison. Stu, is that a one? Is that one potential, do you think? I can't see you spending 85 million, to be honest, uh, the way things are. Maybe he's not this January. Possibly the summer, maybe it's after that, once we've got the new advertising and sponsorships in place. I, I really don't think, I, I, I would say there's got to be 60 million to spend because that's roughly what the bid for Madison, wasn't it? So that's that's still there. Um, and I, I can't see Newcastle at the moment spending 85 million on a player. But the people like the Harrisons and Madisons that were mentioned in that comment there, they're the type that fit, they have the right profile that fit what I was talking about just before. Uh, that would fit into the team, the, the squad, the camaraderie, and have, have the age to grow. So as much as a good player as Mudrick is, I can't say we'll spend the 85 million on I, I genuinely can't. Not that we can't afford it. It's it's not what we're all after. Mitch, it's, it's another name that's going to get bandied around. And I think when, when the chairman does come out, even though he might have been you know slightly taken out of context, I say you'll be surprised who we're going to go for. You know, uh, People can dream, can't they? That's the beauty of this situation for us now. That's that's the joy of it, and that can get Steve Bennett to give us some Ukrainian lessons to help to pronounce it properly. Um, but I, um, I mean, it's it's fantastic that this is now the level and calibre of player that we're being linked with and talked about and talked about um, without people falling off their chair in laughter. You know, we are now seriously in the mix for high quality worldwide names. But I think also that genuinely pretty hard on the, it's got to be the right personality and the right attitude and the blend of, to keep that squad going as well. And I think that's a, it's hellish impressive. But I think also we've got, as as I said on, on Friday night, I think um, Stu and I were made aware of Trippier even getting hold of Isaac after a few days of him being through the door to, get him in line and get him after something he did and that he won't be doing again. Um, and ASM seems to become under uh, Trippier's wing. So I think anybody that comes in with a degree of attitude, the squad themselves will seems, to, seems to sort it out straight away now. Um, and isn't that a wonderful way to be? Um, so yeah, I, I, nothing would surprise us. Nobody would surprise us. 
it's fantastic and fun to be linked with big names like this again, and I'm all for it. Yeah, uh, so the dice tells lies, says Posse Street Henderson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's still, <laughs> it's still predicted a win. It's still predicted a win. Do you always remember the one, Tom? Before. It, yeah, it doesn't go up to four. And it only, biggest, it only predicts biggest, wins and draws as well, I think. Big, um, big, biggest, biggest result on it is 3-1 both ways. That's and then all the, other, all the other ones on it are... Um, there's there's what nil nils one ones two twos, and then two one either way I think. All right, okay. Tom Dixon, yeah, I think we might go for DRB at some point as well. I think he's another one who's potentially on the list anyway. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, and, know, and another one who's gone on played more Champions League and his developments kept going. Mm. So ah. therefore, the interest will remain. I don't watch him, um, and, and I, there's one of my mates watches all of those kind of games, and he, he's not very impressed with Diaby, to be honest. But you know, it's not whether he's impressed with them; it's whether Newcastle's impressed with them. So uh, we will wait and see. Uh, we're after a young Brazilian forward, says Mr. Anderson as well, another potential player uh, coming in. And Jordi Tuvalu says Mudrick twelve months ago was valued at around twenty five million euros, probably go for around fifty million euros. Uh, just watch. And Ian says very good morning to everybody. Kenny says, uh, after yesterday's results, I think we could be looking at a top four place at the end of the season. Um, and Tom saying, would you take anyone from Barcelona in January? Yeah, I mean, big crashes out of the Premier League, uh, out of the Champions League this week, wasn't there, um, Stu? I guess, uh, you know, there may be one or two players at Barcelona of interest in Newcastle. Just have to wait and see. Yeah, but who and where would they play? You know, I mean, they got Lewandowski. I think anyone would be foolish to say they wouldn't see him for the rest of the season. But I don't think Barcelona is a place Newcastle are going to go shopping, uh, unless it's one of the younger players, like the Gavi, etc. But they all have stupid release clauses, don't they? And the way, if we're bringing the football politics back into it, Newcastle go knock into a club like Barcelona, they'll instantly double the price anyway. The names that are appear on, appear on the screen, the Trossards, the Madisons, the Harrisons, these are the ones that are more likely to be where Newcastle will go for the next stage of growth. And once we start getting into the Champions League consistently or winning a trophy, that's when I think we'll get the big, big name because people want to come to us and it makes a difference. We don't need to buy people or wave an uh, open checkbook to get people to come and sign for us. People will want to come and sign for us. And this is why they've, they've targeted, with the exception of, of Trippier. But if you remember that Eddie Howe did a lot of work with Atletico Madrid and he knew Trippier from the Burnley time together. He was at Atletico Madrid and apparently they had a gentleman's agreement that if I get a top job back in the UK, uh, I'll come for you. And he kept his word by getting Newcastle. But also, I wouldn't say instrumental or pivotal, but was someone else who played a role in that was... Uh, John Joe Shelby, who helped sell the region of the club to Trivia. And if you look at every other sign we've had since then, they've all been a lot younger. And so he, he came in as the leader, the one that says, but if he comes out, why shouldn't I go? If someone like that with the reputation he's got, the, the ability he's got, everything, everything that he is, he's the, he's the complete professional, isn't he? With talent. Uh, and it attra that attracted a certain type of the age of, of player and now we're, we're, we're just looking at the shop window but instead of going into I don't know everything's a pound we're now going to the Harrods top floor we can get whatever we want but we'll get what we want and that's the key in that phrase we'll get what we want not what other people want us to have not what agents want us to have not what some player thinks oh I can go to Newcastle and you know, get a nice payday for the last couple of years of your career it's not going to happen it's we're achieving the ascendancy, and these people who will come to us will help us get there. And it's very, very carefully thought out. And that's why I agree with Mitch. There isn't a limit to what we'll spend as long as we get the right person. They prove that with these with these acts. Yeah, uh, Mitch, stay away from Barcelona, says Stu. Um, unless we can really make that pip squeak, and they're very desperate. Then there's a good little deal to be made. How much money do you need? Oh. How much discount are you going to give off that? Oh, you know, um, I, this is a situation I said I could see coming. That if we're in the in the market for a decent player, and somebody's fouled their Champions League plans up and they're needing to balance books, and believe you me, Barcelona need to balance their books, um, there could be some deals to be made. But 
I'm quite sure would also be able to do it in a way, in that win-win way from the Gulf where Barcelona don't look like they've lost too much face. And so um, I would rule nothing out, but at the same time, um, it depends on the character of the individual coming in. Um, and and I, I'm not really sure about the character of many in the Barcelona squad at the moment. So um, I think uh, that would be an interesting conversation with Eddie Howe. Yeah, it uh, certainly would uh, be an interesting conversation. OK, uh, the clock has beaten us uh, today. I'm uh, heading out as well. I am going to come back tonight uh, at half past six and do a live Q&A, just a, a, a live open forum, as I sometimes do, uh, talk about anything and everything. And then, of course, the Monday Club is open again uh, with me and Joe Walker at a slightly later time of seven o'clock tomorrow. So it's your chance to come on the channel and have your say about uh, the weekend's game or anything else you want to talk about with regards to Newcastle. Uh, good to have you on, lads, as always. Enjoy the rest of your day, Stu. Uh, I know yeah, you're off to work. work. I know you're off to work. Mitch, enjoy recovering from your hangover. Uh, take care, yes. lads. See you later. NFL in a roast dinner for me. <laughs> good bad. Take care, lads. Bye-bye. Cheers, lads. A big thanks to all our sponsors, starting with Skips and Bins, telephone 0800 2545 253, email inquiries at skipsandbins.com, website skipsandbins.com, easy contract free and pay as you go waste collection. Uh, thanks to Darren Baldwin Funerals, you can find them at 304 Old Durham Road on Gateshead, uh, telephone 0191 478 273, or email Darren at darrenbaldwinfunerals.co.uk or the website Darren Baldwin Funerals. .co.uk. Thanks to Garden of Healing Dispensary, CBD Hemp and Cannabinoid Specialists. Their website is the gohd.com. And thanks to Three Property Investments, who specialise in sourcing investment properties for their clients who are looking to invest in the Northeast. They offer a full in house service from sourcing the deals to managing the properties for you. They've done over 100 plus deals in the past 12 months for clients all over the UK. Give the guys a follow on Instagram, matty.patter underscore northeast property and phil.read underscore northeast property or email phil at threeproperty.co.uk should you be interested in getting a good property deal. Thanks to Mr. Vicky's Sources, which are handmade in Cumbria. You can order them by going to the website, mrvickys.co.uk or by calling 01768 210102. Thanks to the guys at Blue Hole Brewery. You can find them at blueholebrewery.co.uk. Got a vast range of beers. They're a new brewery company uh, and their cans are suitably uh, addressed like the Jolly Juicier in the strips of Newcastle United from the 90s. Big thank you to Media Arts for all the help with the video side of things and aqtechshop.co.uk, the makers of pool tables and snooker tables in Walls End, Newcastle and the guys who run our website. If you want to subscribe, then hit the subscription button. If you want to hit the likes, then hit the thumb up and please share to your uh, social media. We're also available as a podcast on iTunes and Spotify and the rest goes up 24 hours after the show has finished. If you want to join, well, you can click join underneath the video and become a member for a small fee. If you want to pay the £25 fee and get a cup, a pen, a scarf, a membership card and entry into the monthly draw, then go to the website, nufcmatters.com and click membership or use your smartphone on the QR code, which will take you straight there. We also give you a free car sticker. If you're a subscriber, simply email john at nufcmatters.com to claim your free car window sticker today. We also support the food bank on here, nufcfansfoodbank.co.uk is where you can find the match day bucket and make a virtual donation 365 days of the year. We still do a lot of events in and around the region. If you want to see Super Mac pre-match and after match, you can go to the Dog and Parrot in Newcastle and uh, hear Malcolm give his views on the uh, game and uh, and listen to what he has to say about his career as well. Always a great afternoon. Kids are welcome. Good food, good beer. And get yourself into Pumphreys. Uh, you can always see John Anderson and John Gibson in there pre-match on the cloth market in Newcastle. A couple of events coming up in 2023, an evening with Peter Beardsley, Friday the 10th of February at St. Dom's Catholic Club. You can get the tickets direct from the venue. And Peter Beardsley is also at the Tyneside Irish Centre on Friday, February the 17th. Tickets available from Woucher for that one. Get yourself on the Woucher, make a cracking Christmas present for any Newcastle fan. Also, an evening with Rob Lee, Lee Clark and John Beresford, Friday the 2nd of June 2023 at the Grand Hotel in Gosforth. Uh, tickets for that are available from www.healandtour.org.uk 
forward slash events. And if you fancy a Christmas jumper, get the Bruno Christmas jumper from NUFCMatters.com.